Hi. So this uh, website thing is something I kind of hacked together in Tumblr. Uh, and it's very fun to play with. So let's get into this. All right, so I have, <coughs> I have so many stories in the book, so it's really hard to decide what to get in there. But uh, I, I picked out a few stories that I hope will uh, come together nicely into something that makes sense and is interesting. Uh, close that. Okay, I'm going to start you off with a, a little story about uh, a very simple hypercard game that uh, is really, really cool. So when Robin Miller opened Hypercard for the first time, he drew a picture of a manhole cover. He's not really sure why he drew that. It's just what popped into his head. His goal was to explore the software, to follow his own whims in the hopes that he might devise the foundation for a nice story. Because his older brother Rand had asked him to try out Hypercard, which was a new thing. Rand worked in a bank down in Texas, Robin went to university in Washington. Rand, this is them. That's actually a Gap ad from the mid-90s <laughs> for some reason. Rand was a computer programmer with a wife and a young daughter. He enjoyed playing with his Mac at home, just using it. Uh, he, he'd do some light reading of inside Macintosh occasionally. Uh, this, that, that's like the Bible of the, the original Mac. But he wouldn't actually make any programs. He never had much desire to program with the Mac, even though he was a trained programmer. But then Hypercard came out in 1987, and that changed everything. He was besotted with Hypercard. And he saw in it a, a possibility to design children's software that didn't suck. So he thought, all well, the stuff his daughter was playing was terrible. So he asked Robin, his younger brother with a talent for painting and for music, to help him make an interactive children's book. And Robin said yes, because he was just in the, as enamored of the Macintosh, and because he wasn't doing much anyway, he was just in university. He had some time. So Robin's sitting there on their parents' Macintosh, looking at this black and white manhole cover he's just drawn. And he thinks, well, let's open the cover. So he draws another image. The cover opens, he decides to have a vine grow out of it, kind of stretching up into the sky like Jack and the Beanstalk. And suddenly, there are two paths before him. He's compelled to go up to see where the beanstalk leads, but also to go down to see where it came from. He doesn't want to turn the page. He wants to keep exploring. So he keeps drawing, paths diverging this way and that. Sometimes they wrap back together again, with points of interest to interact with, and other stuff scattered around along the way. And he's drawing it all in the same stream of consciousness style that he started with. He's literally exploring and discovering these places while he draws them. And these will eventually wrap together if we get there. The process is liberating and intoxicating, and pretty soon it becomes clear he's not making an interactive children's book. He's making an interactive world. Now, I'm just going to step back from this for a moment and tell you a few things about myself. So I'm a writer, a storyteller, a journalist. I spend a lot of my time these days working on book projects like this one. And I make a couple of uh, narrative style podcasts on the side. One's about play, the other's on games history. Uh, professionally speaking, I'm primarily a freelancer, at least until I can live off stuff like this. I get paid, sometimes poorly, sometimes well, to write about what appeals to me and my clients in technology, science, and games. I've been doing this for several years. I specialize in long-form features, which is a type of article everyone thought was going to die uh, about a decade ago. I've written hundreds of articles across maybe 30 or so different publications. And I'd say, probably knowing the audience here, there's a pretty good chance that most of you have read something of mine at one point or another. So this one on the left will eventually end up in the same place as the one on the right just stopped. 
So I've done lots of uh, game genre histories for Ars Technica. Also a Mac OS 9 holdouts thing. There are still people who use Mac OS 9 as their primary computer. It's, uh, what, nearly 20 years old now. So it's pretty impressive. I don't have a slide for it. I think the last thing I did for ours was uh, um, Age of Empires development history. I've done lots of app reviews and roundups for MacLife, heaps of features for Polygon. Uh, I do game dev stuff for Gamma Sutra. And I have this book. It's a deep dive into the Mac game scene of the 1980s and the 90s. Back in the days of shareware and black and white pixel graphics of Hypercard and Mist. And that is uh, Rand Miller. Marathon. Yeah. <laughs> Ambrosia software. Uh, I think you can all read that. The break room will remain locked until employee morale improves. <laughs> uh, I'm sure these things are very familiar to some of you, and it's the reason I'm here today. So I really love old games, especially old Mac games. They're weird, they're offbeat. For the most part, they're, they're kind of atypical, they're original. Even when they riff on popular arcade games, a lot of them are really unique. Like the way Andrew Welch's Maelstrom makes asteroids feel cool and edgy just by sampling pop culture from the early 90s. Like there's Simpsons stuff and Beavis and Butthead that he just recorded off the TV. There's the quirky Egyptian spin that John Calhoun put on Joust when he tried to remake it from a memory of working in a pizza place one summer. There's this game that's beerware, which means, so it was released uh, on a, at a license where they say, if you like the game, please send us alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an incredible reimagining of Gravatar. So there's some gravity stuff going on. So I grew up with Macs and Mac gaming. My dad bought a Mac Plus, which looks kind of like that, before I was born. Some of my earliest memories revolve around that machine. And I remember the first time I was truly captivated by a video game was when I was watching cartoons on TV. I was probably three or four years old. I think Captain Planet was on, but it could have been Banana Man. <laughs> so my brother had just got this new game called Alternate Reality of the City. That is my box. I still have the box. The discs don't work, and they've been overridden long ago. So the moment he started this game up, I zipped over there. I wanted to see what this incredible thing was about. There was this huge spaceship on the screen. It was descending down towards the city. And it was snagging people in its tractor beam. And there was some pretty music playing in the background. And then, I think I'm remembering this right, but I, I might be uh, just remembering a different version of the game. It pops out into space and some song lyrics appear over the top of this moving star field. It's like karaoke style sequence to the music. And then finally you appear at some nifty looking gate, scrolling numbers on it. And once you step through that, you're in the city. So this is all black and white because this is still the days when most Mac games were just black pixels on a white background and because this was a Mac Plus and it didn't even have color output. And if, if people don't know, that is literally just black pixels and white. There's no gray in there. So Alternate Reality, uh, it's this really ambitious role-playing game. It was originally made for Atari 8-bit computers. This is the original version. You plop down in this mysterious medieval sort of looking city. Uh, but if the sequels had all come out, it would have turned out that it was a simulated reality crafted by the aliens who abducted you. That is the premise. And so then you, you go into this world, you just left to fend for yourself. It's kind of plays like a predecessor to the Elder Scrolls games, if people know Skyrim and Morrowind and things. It had this really massive scope, it was open-ended, also brutally difficult. Like there's death around every corner, and no, there's no tutorial. But it has a cult status now, because it innovated like crazy. You could get drunk in the game, and the interface would mess up. You could get hungry. 
thirsty, tired, hot, cold, sick. I once read that your character can die of scurvy if they don't eat fruit for several years. You could get a job, you could put money in the bank, you'd earn variable interest rates on it. <laughs> and there are some really fancy graphics effects as well, so it's not just the gameplay. There's rain, uh, kind of pseudo-continuous movement, uh, the light level would change as the day wore on. And I, I don't remember, but these things probably had to be fudged a lot for black and white on the Mac. And some of it might have even been missing. I haven't checked because I can't get the game to run. Uh, the copy protection on it means it doesn't work properly in emulators. You need to hack it, and I haven't got around to it. So it's this really impressive piece of engineering and atmospheric game. And I don't think I played much of it. I don't think my brother got very far into it. But that introduction and our early wanderings around this hostile, mysterious world seemed, that seems so fully realized, this stuck with me. And when I think back on this now, I realize it's probably the moment everything changed for me. This was the thing that made me obsessed with stories, with discovering new worlds and learning what makes them tick. And that's kind of what I do now as a journalist and a tech historian. It's what I tried to do with my book. And that's maybe fitting because the best stories I heard when I was researching the book involved people doing this pretty much exact same thing. So it's what Robin and Rand Miller did with their game The Manhole. And it's what they and the rest of the team that they recruited at Cyan did with Mist a few years later. And that, in turn, inspired millions of people to uh, try and create their own things. It's what the game design luminary Chris Crawford did when he made this fascinating but commercially disastrous Mac-only game about interpersonal interactions. A game that he called Seaboot in honor of his cat Bootsy, whose really tragic, drawn-out death inspired him to search for a way to design an icon-based conversational language that could be understood without words. As you can see, he kind of worked, worked out, <laughs> not entirely. And so uh, it's what Will Wright did when he made SimCity, a landmark industry-changing game that also happened to arouse a passion for game design in a young Japanese Apple fan called Yut Saito who recalled being so spellbound when I talked to him by the aura and imaginative potential of SimCity that he once played it for almost 24 hours straight. And whose homage, Sim Tower, itself became a hit. The most compelling entertainment experiences arouse passions in us we don't necessarily realize are there. They induce ideas that inspire us to think differently. I think the Macintosh was like that. The single most common thing I heard in my interviews for The Secret History of Mac Gaming was that the release of the Mac, or a little later of Hypercard, flicked a switch in people's brains that made them want to make games. Not just any games. Games that were different because Macintosh was different. So to give you a few numbers here, it had this high resolution screen. It was 512 by 342 pixels. Most PCs at the time, they'd be 320 by 200 or by 240. They'd have 8 or 16 colors, but these were really horrible, ugly colors, and you're maybe better off with black and white anyway. The Mac had a desktop interface. You had icons. You had overlapping windows. You controlled it with a mouse. Most of the other mass market computers at the time, they had command lines and keyboard-only interfaces. All these features made the Mac far more intuitive and exciting to computing novices. And that greater accessibility in turn made people want to use their Macs more. And so this is the 1980s, and if you want to use your computer to do more stuff, you pretty soon end up wanting to program stuff, because there's not much to do. So the mouse and Mac user interface together form this huge inspiration for early Mac game developers. It inspired the guys at ICOM simulations to pretty much invent point-and-click adventure games. This is a 
two or three years before Maniac Mansion, which is often credited as the one that started it all. It totally changed the simulation game market by offloading a huge amount of the cognitive load from managing several separate parallel game modes, each of which was confined to a different screen and set of keyboard commands. There are keyboard overlays that are literally every single key on the keyboard corresponds to something for this DOS game and many others. And putting all of that, the Mac would put all of that in drop-down window, drop, pull-down menus and overlapping windows. Just look at how much more information you get in these two screenshots. It was actually a specific program that was bundled with the original Mac that had perhaps the largest influence. It was called Mac Paint. And it comes up again and again when you talk to these early Mac developers. It was this striking revelation to them. I spent about a minute on that. It was an illustration of the paradigm shift that was underway in mid-1980s computing. A wonderful, fun way to learn the intricacies of operating a mouse. A vivid representation of what you see is what you get. Document creation. It was multi-dimensional, modeless a tool for drawing and painting on a computer screen. It was so intuitive and easy to use that many developers considered it the bar against which their own work should be compared. It drove them to build things that nobody had done before and to strive for ever greater heights of innovation in software and game design. And there are lots of stories I can tell you about this. There's a really fun one about how Mac Paint led to Crystal Quest, which some of you know. But the story I want to share here is of a clever idea to turn Mac Paint itself into a game. So like so many other tech people at the time, Scott Kim loved the Macintosh. And he was especially taken by <coughs> Mac Paint. His first experience of Mac Paint was actually Susan Kerr demonstrating the program in 1984. So if you don't know who she is, she created the icons and fonts and most of the other graphic design for the original Macintosh and its system software. Here are some of the icons that she made. When I spoke to Kim two years ago, he said it was the most memorable demo he'd ever seen. And this, no doubt, would have been partly due to her brilliance, but also as Mac Paint was such a joy to use and it worked so elegantly within severe limitations. So I want to talk about those limitations for a moment. And back to this. You can only draw with the mouse. Because there's no touch screen. Graphics tablets haven't been invented yet. Well, they have, but they're not available for a personal computer like this. And drawing with a mouse is kind of like drawing with a deck of cards, if you've ever tried it. It's very, very hard to do it well. And then you have the graphical limitations. So you have black pixels on a white background, and that's it. You have half a dozen or so shape primitives. So you've got what, rectangle, rounded rectangle, oval, and then a couple of, of more versatile tools. You had freehand drawing tool, some pattern fills. You see them at the bottom, nice pixel patterns. You could add some text. You didn't have any layers, really. Your canvas was about the size of the screen, just a little bit smaller. And yet, it's this incredibly powerful and versatile thing. So much so that in the first few years of the Mac, the magazine Macworld had a section in every issue dedicated to just showing off things that people had made in Mac Paint. These two illustrations were done in Mac Paint. It's incredible what people would come up with. So back to the story, Scott Kim thought Mac Paint was great. And one day he had this idea to build a game within Mac Paint that would be played using the Mac Paint tools. And he became entranced by this idea. He loved to teach people, to share knowledge. And this would be a fun and novel way for him to share his knowledge of something called ambigrams and some other typeface manipulation tricks. So this is an ambigram of the word ambigram. 
they are words that read upside down and uh, right side up. So they're like graphic palindromes. Back in 1981, he'd authored a book called Inversions that was a collection of ambigrams, and it sold well. But now, several years later, he saw this opportunity to step people through the process of making them in a more interactive and fun way. And so that's what he did. He made this product called Letterforms and Illusion. It came on a floppy disk with a copy of Mac Paint. Unmodified, except there was this extra pull-down menu you'd get on the side. And it contained a few extra commands uh, that helped with um, navigating and manipulating the game files. So you see it there on the right, flips is the menu. There were 62 Mac Paint files split into about a dozen categories for the different types of puzzles. So you had tutorials, flips, illusions, tessellations, blends, close-ups, uh, kind of MC Escherisms and so on. And each file contained written instructions and a puzzle to solve. Like this, and this, and this. Maybe see if you can do that in your head. That was basically the whole game. So he somehow managed to take Mac Paint, this simple but elegant program for drawing on your computer screen, and he turned it into an enthralling puzzle game. He made its limitations feel like features. And it was really cool and fun to play with. And there's a reason I chose this story out of all the many stories I've been told about Mac Paint and about the Mac inspiring game developers. And that is to emphasize the power of limitations. So limitations are like a framework for creativity. They provide you with a predefined set of tools and a basic outline of what's possible. Limitations are amazing. They help you focus. They help you think. And back in the 1980s and 90s, computer game developers had a lot of limitations to contend with. There was no World Wide Web, for one thing. No Dropbox, no Gmail, no GitHub. Not even Skype or BitTorrent. In fact, when the game Spaceship Warlock was in development, its two creators, Mike Sines and Joe Sparks, lived on opposite sides of America. One in Chicago, <coughs> the other in San Francisco. That's 3,000 kilometers apart. And keep in mind, this is 1990. So they couldn't video conference or pop their files in a shared online repository. Their means of communication were phone, fax, like snail mail sharing, actual letters and parcels, or going on to AOL and using the painfully slow dial-up to share tiny little files. And so this wasn't anything particularly new. There was another story a few years before of Jonathan Gay and Mark Stephen Pierce, also Mac developers, <coughs> when they were developing Dark Castle, which is that. So they likewise were Chicago and California. And they got around the problem by mailing floppy disks back and forth. So PS would send design specs and graphics, and then Gabe would send new builds of the game, because he was the programmer. But Sparks and Science, they couldn't do that. Spaceship Warlock was going to be a CD-ROM game, a sort of interactive movie adventure with fancy pre-rendered 3D graphics. They wanted to capture a sense of the scale, of depth and wonder they'd gotten from films like Star Wars and Blade Runner. And here's a poster they mocked up. So this says, uh, robustly detailed and dazzling in its sweep and depth, Spaceship Walk is a blazing, swashbuckling, wonder-filled science fiction epic in the grand tradition. Advanced graphics, 3D animation, and an original music score combined to create a cinematic adventure in which you become the central character. It's a virtual walkthrough adventure simulation light years beyond anything you've ever seen before. So this was ridiculously ambitious. Nobody was making CD-ROM games in 1990, and why would they? Barely anybody even had a CD-ROM drive. There were about as many CD-ROM entertainment products as you could count on one hand. And most of those were just enhanced versions of floppy disk products. And all the same, Sparks and Science, they felt confident that if they made a really great game, people would buy it. People with CD-ROM drives would buy it, 
because they need something cool to justify their purchase, which cost them maybe 700 to to $1,000, maybe a bit more. People without CD-ROM drives, they hoped might buy it too, because hey, CD-ROM drives are clearly the future, and this game's worth jumping in on the technology early. And they, they thought they had some chance of pulling it off, because Joe Sparks had been working at NASA Ames, building 3D computer models and composing music for uh, these space simulations and videos, when Mike Sines actually talked him into working on the game. And Mike Sines, meanwhile, had co-created the first commercially published digital comic book, Shatter, as well as helped out Macromind, which became Macromedia later, and they got absorbed into Adobe, on uh, comic works and graphics works to creative apps. And he'd also made a strange piece of interactive adult entertainment called Mac Playmate. I didn't think it would be appropriate to put a screenshot of that <laughs> in here. So these guys, they weren't just a random pair of wannabes. They knew their shit. And if anybody could pull off an interactive movie game about space pirates, it would be them. But before I tell you what happened, i give you some more context. So a standard 3.5 inch floppy disk stores about 1.4 megabytes of data. A CD-ROM, depending on its exact specs, will hold 600 to 700 megabytes. In 1990, most hard drives didn't hold anywhere near that match. In fact, Joe Sparks told me the internal drive on his Mac 2 FX was 80 megabytes. And he bought an external drive for $800. That was a whopping 120 megabytes. And that 120 meg drive, that's for developing the game with its many 3D models, each of which would be many megabytes in size. And so they could chat about the game over the phone. They could send sketches over fax. But they needed a way to reliably get these large files between them. And at this point, you're probably thinking, well, that's easy. You just burn the CD. Well, no. See, the CD-ROM drives were pretty expensive, maybe a 1000 bucks. <coughs> But they could only read CDs. If you wanted to record data to a CD, to burn a CD, you needed to get something else, and that would cost maybe $100,000. During development, somewhere along the way, they got really excited. A new product came out, could burn CDs. It was $30,000. So this is 1990 money, so that's even worse than it sounds. <laughs> But still, they, they thought, oh man, it's almost in reach. And so let's recap here. They can't use the internet. They can't use floppy disks because it's too big. They can't use CDs because it's too expensive to get them burned. What they can do is send a hard drive. Remember, they have one hard drive for developing the game. Their only hard drive with a full copy of everything. And so they'd send that back and forth for months, developing the game. And then they'd need to ship it off to a mastering company for a test pressing. And then again, later on, for the production run. And you can imagine all the ways this could have gone wrong. Joe Sparks told me that he'd worked out the exact time he needed to finish work each day so that he could race out of his apartment, drive to the DHL parcel center, hand off the drive before 5 p.m. for cutoff to do overnight delivery to Mike Science, who'd do his thing and send it back, ready for Sparks to work on it some more. So they go back and forth like this. Every few days, the hard drive changes hands. And if you miss that cutoff, well, that's really wasted productivity. And they had even greater limitations than this. So even though CD-ROM drives could hold more than 600 megabytes of data, they had to keep the game under 120 because it had to fit in that drive. And that's a problem because 3D pre-rendered graphics take up a lot of space. And drive transfer speeds were slow, 150 kilobytes a second. CPUs at the time, they weren't really fast enough to handle decompression on the fly without 
sacrificing too much frame rate or making load times unbearably long. So to avoid stuttering and to preserve this cinematic feel and immersion that they wanted, they found they had to keep the graphics and sound files uncompressed. And they had to be 8-bit, even though Max at the time could, ha could handle 16-bit. So in practical terms, we're talking 256 color graphics and 11 kilohertz sound files, both uncompressed. And this is not the ideal compromise, but it looked OK. You get a Blade Runner vibe from, from that. <laughs> so Spaceship Warlock came out on the Mac in early 1991. And despite all those limitations, this is less than a year after they started development. But unfortunately, it's about a year before CD-ROM drives started to become standard features on any Macs in the product. And the game was priced at 100 US dollars, or 99 dollars to be specific, which makes it one of the most expensive games ever released up to that point. And yet somehow, despite all it had going, going against it, the price, this ambition that outscaled the technology, the poor market penetration of CD-ROM drives, the high cost of CD-ROM drives, it actually did pretty well. It earned $4 million. They had dared to dream of a pre-rendered 3D space opera adventure that would be worthy of the great sci-fi films of the age. And while they didn't exactly scale the heights of Blade Runner or Star Wars, they still made a game that a lot of people loved. It turned them into, a celeb into celebrities in Japan. It was a game that inspired others to shoot for the stars themselves in this dream of interactive movies. And the world has changed tremendously since this happened 25, 30 years ago. But there are a few lessons here that I think apply to games and app development today. So one of them is to embrace limitations. They're one of the most powerful creative tools at your disposal. But don't let them define you or dictate what's possible. There's always another way around the problem. Time, space, storage, memory, processing power, your input methodologies. These things and more are the walls that box you in. But also the mechanisms by which you might escape, if only you use them to your <coughs> advantage. Let your tools inspire you. You probably don't want to replicate the UI of Photoshop or Xcode. But, and you know, maybe it, it's not a good idea to turn those into a game either. But maybe there's something special about the feeling that's evoked by a particular uh, function in an app. Uh, a button, a task, a gesture, a workflow. Steal it. Put something in your program that evokes that same feeling. The game Crystal Quest, I mentioned earlier, came from Patrick Buckland's observation that his drunken friends got tremendous joy from just using the eraser tool in Mac Paint. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he just made a game about erasing things. SimCity. It emerged from the fun that Will Wright had using the level letter he'd built for his previous game. It was called Raid on Bungling Bay. And it ended up also borrowing heavily from the interface as well as this general feeling of using Mac Paint. To the point where I would argue, and it was actually argued, argued to me by Will's neighbor from back in the day, that SimCity is basically a paint program for designing cities. It's a Mac Paint for cities. Remember to dream, to think of new realities and imagine a better way to do things whether it's interactions, interfaces, storytelling, graphic design, code, anything else. The design of one of the very best mobile games of 2015, Lara Croft Go, came from the developers taking their memories of the feeling they got playing the early Tomb Raider games. Just their memories. Some 18 or so years later, they didn't dare play the game again. They didn't want to confuse themselves. And they imagined how that same sense of isolation they recalled, the sense of adventure, of discovery, could be translated into a modern puzzle game. One of the most popular Mac games of the 90s, a shareware title called Escape Velocity, 
it was a 2D space game these days, we'd probably call it open world. It has drawn many parallels over the years to the 1980s space game by David Brabant, Elite. But Matt Birch, who made Escape Velocity, he'd never played Elite. He wanted to. Poor guy bought the game as a kid. And he's cycling home from the store, and somewhere along the way, he loses the copy protection device. It's like a prism that you need to use to unscramble some code on the screen. And the store wouldn't let him take it back, so he never got to play the game. He can only read the manual over and over again. <laughs> and there's a short story in there about a fictional space pilot that would fight pirates while uh, traveling the galaxy. And so then, when it came time to design Escape Velocity a decade later, he took his imaginings of what Elite must have been like just from reading this manual over and over and over. And he combined it with his dreams of spacefaring that he had while reading uh, model rocketry catalogs, one of his hobbies, Doc Smith novels, so these pulp novels, and the section of Stephen Levy's book Hackers that dealt with the creation of one of the first ever computer games, Space War. His dreams of what Elite might have been informed what Escape Velocity was. Now, I wasn't going to mention this one, but after the quiz last night, I thought <laughs> I'd throw in an extra example. This is the gigantic 403-room house from a game called Glider Pro. It's a paper airplane game. You've got to uh, navigate your plane through each room in the house. This gigantic house was literally inspired by dreams. John Calhoun, the developer, had a recurring dream for years in which he's stuck in this huge house and he doesn't know the way out. There are people everywhere going about their business, doing stuff. But he never sees any windows, he never sees an exit. And then he thought, let's make a glider-like version of that. And so he made this huge house, and you see how big the basement levels are. There's no, no hope of light there. And in glider terms, there's no people, so there's lots of like, toasters and goldfish and basketballs that bounce up and down for no reason. And so continuing, do your research. If you're excited about an idea for a new project, but you're worried that the potential audience is too small, don't give up yet. Look online, ask around, do some digging. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you'll create a new genre, new market category. Maybe you'll find some new niche. You might be surprised. I spoke to Zach Barth from the game studio Zachtronics last week. This is one of their, this is their new game. He's basically built a career on making games that appeal almost exclusively to programmers who like to optimize their code. Here are two solutions to the same puzzle. One is more efficient than the other. So perhaps you have a problem that you need to solve with the current project or an idea you haven't seen done before. Just go digging into software and games history. Chances are it has been done. Many times, probably. And maybe you can learn from their mistakes. Even if you're not trying to reinvent the wheel, or design the next big thing, I guarantee there are lessons in the past. But don't look only to the past. It's important to still be aware of the trends in the present. So take inspiration from the dreams of those who came before you. Because the funny thing about big ideas is they become smaller over time. An idea that was once too big for the technology, or the people using it, it might not be too big now. The latest game consoles are built on the same ideas that killed the 3DO, the Pippin, the Laser Active, the new one. Most of you probably haven't heard of any of them. The world wasn't ready for them 20, 25 years ago. We have a whole genre of games now that we call walking simulators. And these are really remarkably close to the ideals behind some flawed, fascinating games. Just to rifle off the Mac, the Closest Macintosh examples I know, the manhole, Scarab of Ra, Nightfall, and the Colony. These are all games 
that are deeply flawed because they were made too soon for the technology to handle them properly. So learn from the past. The history of computing, games, technology, it's packed with lessons that we can carry into the future. But don't just look at the big famous stuff. There is so much amazing creativity and innovation, both well executed and not, that you can find lost in the weeds of history, in the, obscure, in the obscurities. So just to wrap up a few general things, uh, some shameless self-promotion. I, I have copies of the book, uh, this Mac gaming book with me today, if you want to buy one. It's uh, $50. I have a, another book that's going into a crowdfunding project with my publisher uh, very soon, maybe this week. You can email me anytime, Twitter, 